welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it's always a pleasure to have you with us here on the program as we uh, get set to talk with uh, another very special guest. I consider all of my guests special because uh, they have taken time out of their busy schedules, as it were, to uh, share with us here on the program the works that they are involved in to help make their lives better and the lives of the people around them. My special guest today is joining us uh, to talk about Voices of Eden, Ancient Wisdom and Healing Music Institute. We talk about sound and music and toning all the time. Eliana Gillad is the founder thereof at elianagillad.com, and I want to thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you so much for having me, Richard. Uh, I'd just like to make a, a uh, little correction up front that the main website is voicesofeden.com. All right. Well, we will be a linked to voicesofeden.com. I actually have both of them up on my screen here, so uh, we will focus on VoicesOfEden.com. Folks, go there. Uh, we're going to talk about Emerging Triumph, Thrive Through Uncertainty by Eliana Gilad. And uh, I tell you what, that's the key word. That is the key word, uh, and I'll put it in a little, slightly different context. <clears throat> I'm not alone. I am absolutely fed up, exhausted, tired, and annoyed with the continuation of survival. I want thrival, and I know I'm not alone, Ileana. Well, wait, can I ask you a question? Sure. Where do you, where do you see it? Where do you see it being, uh, how is it manifesting? And, and those of you listening, please, I'm so curious about this. Where is it happening most in your life? And to whom is it happening? We're all going through it, but uh, this is such an important conversation. So I'm so happy you're bringing it up, like right up front. But I'm curious for you, Richard, where do you, where are you seeing it? I would say that when, when I step out of <clears throat> the observer mode, which does get, I get distracted very easily. I like little bright, shiny things, you know. Oh, butterfly! <laughs> but every once in a while, uh, I will be distracted by uh, the day-to-day -day things that I have to deal with in terms of, for example, uh, finances. Um, having to go through the process of making sure that, oh, did I, did I pay the rent this month? And did I take care of that? And <clears throat> did I feed the animals? And uh, we have chickens and cats and a dog. And, and, and I, again, th th I enjoy doing most of this. And when I am dealing with the finances, I am always uh, saying uh, that I am, I'm grateful for being able, <clears throat> being able to pay the rent, pay the phone, pay the electric and so forth. I'm grateful that I, I have that opportunity, you know, uh, that I have the wherewithal, that I have the career that has allowed me to bring that in. Uh, I'm very cognizant of abundance and prosperity, but I think probably <clears throat> the, the, the best source as you're asking the question uh, is probably the stories that I see of people who are just, as the phrase goes, making it from paycheck to paycheck. And it isn't just about uh, the finances. Uh, it's about relationships. It's about uh, uh, the challenges that uh, have been placed before us in terms of our beliefs, our personal philosophies, whether they be political, religious, and, and economic, or whatever and that uh, we cannot seem to get along with one another. I mean, what was it uh, um, after the, the, the 2016 election? There were a number of separations and divorces by couples because they didn't see eye to eye and they couldn't deal with one another. I'd never heard of anything like that before. So, really? Over ideology, you're gonna say, bye-bye. You know, uh, I can understand abuse, but wow. So I think that it's <clears throat> it's the common man's plight, if you will, in the in that regard that I think a lot of people uh, uh, that I observe 
going through. Yet at the same time, I'm also seeing a lot of folks during times of contraction, they are expanding. And this is one of the, the, the rules or laws that I've heard about. That's what you want to do. If, if, if things are contracting, whether you call it inflation or recession or I don't care what you call it, you're supposed to expand. So I, I would say a long answer uh, to, to your question, uh, me being the interviewer, <laughs> <laughs> and I do appreciate the question, um, I would say that's, that's probably uh, where that thought comes from because I know a lot of people, man, it would just be nice to be able to not to think about any of that stuff and maybe go to the park or in my case, go to the beach and just relax and play in the water and, and maybe get out on a kayak or go uh, dolphin watching or whale watching or go out to the Channel Islands and, and do some scuba diving and again, not have to think about any of that because all of that that I just mentioned is, to me, that's part of the thriving uh, in this life, enjoying where we are and who we are and what we have. Wow. I know that's a lot. No, I really appreciate your your response, and it helps me to uh, give a better interview, too. <laughs> no, really, it's because it's part of, no, like in real life, you know, in real life, showing up in real time, like that's part of thriving through uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and And I love what you say about, contraction and expansion because it really really relates to how I see the world and and uh, you know you mentioned the book emerge triumph and thrive through uncertainty and so much of it is uh, uh, well those of you who who didn't read the show notes or don't know about me I'm a um, I'm a so I was born under the Hollywood sign my life has been more interesting than any Hollywood movie I, I left the United States in 1992. I was born in a hospital called Cedars of Lebanon, which I guess was a prophecy of my future in the Middle East, because I lived most of my adult life uh, in, in the Middle East through three wars, social unrest and displacement. I'm a direct descendant I'm part of the Levite tribe on both my mother and my father's side, which wow. makes me a direct descendant of Moses. And to our discussion here, more importantly, his elder sister, the prophetess Miriam. And my life has been devoted to the resurgence of an ancient healing voice in feminine leadership way. When I say feminine leadership, I'm not talking about man or woman. I'm talking about... Uh, that listening inside, operating from inside out. And when you talk about contraction and expansion, it is so appropriate to this because in ancient times, we lived according to matriarchal worldview where there are like seasons, like there are many levels of reality occurring at the same time. And, and the ancient use or historical precedences of uh, application of uh, healing voice and rhythm we see in ancient hieroglyphics in ancient Israel and in ancient Egypt and they're on the way to birthing chambers and to funerary chambers and there is such an allegory to birth and when you think about you know transition and think about birth, it's bloody contractions. Uh, you know, when you're the, I had the, the last book is Miriam's Secret, uh, revealing the ancient wisdom of feminine leadership. And the first title to it was midwiving the birth of your inner transformation. And during that time, I interviewed and Emerge, Triumph and Thrive Through Uncertainty is an expansion and an enhancement of, of that book. And there was a midwife, I, I'm founder of a medically proven healing voice method that I developed over these 20 plus years living through those three wars. And in the process of that, a midwife 
invited me to train midwives and doulas. And so it was in the middle of writing that, that initial book and I asked to interview her. And I asked her, how, like, how do you see transformation and change with midwifery? Because Miriam was also known as a midwife. And she said, well, how could I not see that? She said, you know, my job as a midwife I don't do a lot, but then there comes a time when the woman starts going through contractions. That's when I start paying attention. And there gets to a point in the contraction where the woman hits what we say in the professional field, the wall. I said, what's the wall? She said, it's that point where the woman freaks out. She panics because she doesn't know whether she's going to get out dead or alive. There's no, she can't push anymore. She can't do anymore. She goes, at that point, I know as a midwife that the birth is imminent and it's a healthy birth. I said, what? How's that? <laughs> it just astounded me. She goes, because at that point, the human being can't do anymore. She can't do anymore. Nature takes over. She goes, I'm trained as a midwife. I have the tools. You know, I, I know what to do to help nature so that the baby can be born. She said, where the problem happens, and we see it more and more in modern times, why premature births are an epidemic, why uh, uh, there's premature death where there's death during birth of the mother and the baby is where the woman won't let go of wanting to control. She doesn't know how to let go. She doesn't know how to freak out. She's got to do something. That's when you know, this woman had a home birthing center and you know assisted at like 1500 births in a traditional hospital setting. She goes, with those women, that's when I have to call an ambulance and they can't have a home birth. They invested all this time, all this money, all this effort to have a serene you know, birth but she won't let go. And, you know, she's going to kill herself and her baby. That's when I call the ambulance and, you know, there's a C-section. I thought that astounds me. And what we're going through today, we're, you know, how I see it, we're, you know, we're in the contraction phase of birth into a new era. And none of us knows how that will be. Not one human being alive. And it's worldwide. There is not a human being who is, you know, not facing this. And we're tantamount to those times of the parting of the waters, you know, of the, it's history repeats itself. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, and again, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I, of course, as a man, I can't really relate to, to the birthing process, but I do find it partially humorous but i know the woman is dead serious when she says this at a certain point when she hits that wall i can't do this anymore and i'm going uh it's too late for that yeah yeah <laughs> but wait can i ask you i don't know if that's the, can, can we explore this for a moment that's very interesting yeah i've I, i've heard that on some programs and i've also heard some women uh who will will actually utter that phrase not all but some my yeah. mo my mother had six i don't know if she ever uttered that phrase but uh, I know that the pain, if they aren't, if, if, for example, if it's in a hospital, certainly they have drugs they can give you, painkillers and so forth. Um, but I've, I've heard that phrase <laughs> come out of a woman. Uh, uh, can, can we explore this for a moment? I, I want sure. to challenge that idea. Absolutely. Uh, feminine power and feminine leadership applies to both men and women. Mm -hmm. so I, I met this a lot when, when I was planning for my second TED talk, the organizer would challenge me with this because he said, I don't know. It's a, these are businessmen, you know, most of the people in the audience in your language, I said, well, you invited me to give this second TED talk. It's trust your silent voice. I said, how would you relate to this? So he was definitely plugged in, yeah. but from a, you know, from a masculine perspective, which they're flip sides of the same coin. Sure. So what really, what I loved about that, I loved listening to him because I listened to him. I said, why did you, like, then why did you invite me? You know, what is it that's interesting you, interesting to you? He goes, well, there's this thing like, you know, when you have a nudge inside, Okay, 
So what if you, so you were just talking about um, like what we're all going through now, like the, the, the drudgery. And yeah. so we're all, I, how I see it is that we're all, we're humanity. We're in the midst of a new birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're in the midst of, you know, of that contraction phase. All right. Where we're all, and I see that's where all the dissension comes from. Yeah. And when we, you know, and, and uh, so do you have like when you're going and you're obviously committed because you show up in this podcast day in, day out. And that's a, you know, that's a motherhood. It, you know, you're, you're, you're responsible. You know, you're, you're the caregiver for this very important program that is sharing new stories for a new paradigm. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? It absolutely does. And I want to remind our listeners, when you're listening to Tell Me Your Story, we're talking with uh, Eliana Gilad, and uh, we are talking about the work that she does through a website we want you to go through, go to VoicesOfEden.com, VoicesOfEden.com, Ancient Wisdom and Healing Music Institute, of which I want to talk more about as we continue on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it is really a pleasure. I'm, I'm really getting a charge out of this because... Eliana's turning the tables on me from time to time here, asking me the questions, which is perfectly okay. This is not a question and answer program. This is a conversation that we're having, and I love it. Um, in terms of what you are saying, you're, uh, uh, back in 2007, I had on this program, that long ago, I had on this program Barbara Marks Hubbard, who used the was very it, analogy... Barbara was a Barbara. very dear friend of mine. Well, she used to talk about the fact that we are going to go through birth pangs. And it is going to be a little on the painful side for some, uh, more than others maybe, but that that's the process. But when it's all over, you have this beautiful baby, this, this you know, gorgeous uh, 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 new individual, this new person who's come into this world and now... You get to nurture it and, and guide it and help it to grow strong and learn how to speak and walk and talk and, and so on and so forth. And sort of, and even though that can be challenging, my parents will attest to doing that six <laughs> times, it's still a joy because, uh, and it can still be a challenge. You know, the, the, the infant as it grows up as a toddler and so forth, there will be challenging moments, but overall it's like, wow, this is incredible that, that we brought this new life. And I, I actually view it from the standpoint, the continuation of life. I mean, it's two cells coming together to make, uh, yes, it's a new unique life through the combination of those cells, but it's also a continuation of life because you don't get, <clears throat> in this context, you don't get life from dead cells, not in this context. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, blood is that life force. Yes. And if we're, and, and you know, if we're only operating for, cognitively from our mind, like that's what's causing such a difficulty now and such exhaustion because we're, uh, and it makes total sense. Why wouldn't we operate that way? That's how we've been inculcated for the last, you know, and educated for the last 3000 years. Yeah. You know, and there's no no judgment there. There's no belief system. There's no right or wrong. It's just a matter. It's a matter of focus. It just but is. It, That's it, just the way exactly. it has been. Exactly. And so the, yet at the same time, there's still your intuition. There's still, you know, what you know, what the Ted organizer, I love it, he called it the nudge, you know, yeah. there's still that inner nudge. Yet those voices, that part of you that, that, you know, may have an inner knowing, do you know what I'm talking about? You Absolutely. have an inner knowing, but you don't have words to go with it. Absolutely. That, that is your true voice. Yeah. And that is, and, and that's in the belly, you know, that's in the womb, that's in the feminine place. It's not birthed yet. It's not yet cognitive. And yeah. what this whole approach is, is a means to help you connect to that place of your inner knowing and then 
the approach and the tools are a kind of like a bridge in the midwife to help you birth that inner knowing with your outer cognitive expression. Well, and of course, we talk about that all the time on this program because we encourage people to go within during the decade of perfect vision where we ask them to sit still in this quiet, calm, peaceful place and listen to what we refer to as that still small voice. I mean, I've, I haven't used this example for a long, long time, <clears throat> but when I was bicycling everywhere back and when I was living in Phoenix, I was heading to work and where I was working was what we, where we called out of the South 40 uh, because I had to pedal uh, on paved roads through farm fields and the, the farm fields out there were one mile square. Oh, wow. deal, not a big deal, but I'm traveling along, heading to work, and all of a sudden I'm getting this impression. You need to turn right at the next intersection. Turn right. And I'm going, yeah, but that takes me three miles out of my way because if I just, you know, but the shortest distance between two points, et cetera, et cetera. I go a half a mile past the intersection and the prompting would not go away. I turned around, I went back to that intersection. I made what then was, of course, a left turn. I went up a mile. I went over a mile. I went back down to the main street that I, the, the street that I was on originally and continued on to work. I don't know what in the Sam Hill that was all about because I don't know that I maybe avoided an accident. Uh, maybe it's the, sort of like that butterfly effect. If I make a change then. Right, yeah. But I came to the conclusion many years later thinking about it. The, 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 your still small voice was the universe was not trying to have you avoid catastrophe or anything. It was seeing if you were serious. Oh, I love it. Yeah. 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 Listening to the yeah. prompting. The measure of a person, it's not when everything's all fine and dandy. You know, after we did the, the research on this, uh, you know, on the, on the music, then you know, I sitting on a hilltop in Galilee and war breaks out, bombs dropping, everybody flees. And I'm like, you know, what am I gonna flee and pretend like nothing's happening? If, you know, if I've devoted my life to this thing, like this is the time to test it out. Not when all is well, yeah. but when the proverbial big caca hits the fan, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and you know, that's the measure. It's not, you know, we like bullhooey ourselves by, you know, oh, yeah, I, I love what you said. You know, it's not like, how well are you listening? Yeah. And, and the thing that you said, you're fed up, annoyed with the survival. Yeah. How fed up are you with bullhooeying yourself? Yeah. Because you're not, not willing to meet and respect that small, still voice inside that's guiding you, you know, like the one that you did listen to. Who knows, you know, maybe going around the extra mile, who knows, maybe tomorrow, five years from, who knows, you know, that the answers are clear when we look back 2020. Yeah. And, you know, and like our beautiful, gorgeous, in, you know, imperfect human attributes, it's like, no, 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 shall prove it to me first and then I'll dare, <laughs> you know, then I'll yeah. jump. Well, I will tell you that um, as I have practiced not only listening to, but also following the promptings, uh, it it does get easier and easier to the point where I don't even think about it anymore. Um, for example, uh, even this morning as I'm coming into work, uh, I'm, I'm traveling down and uh, there's this fork in the road. As I'm coming, as I'm in the city, there's a fork in the road. I can go down, continue down the main street, or I can go down this usual side street, single lane traffic, uh, down to the next cross street where I need to turn to continue on to the radio station. And I will, I will turn in the direction that I'm guided to turn. Again, not knowing nor really caring why just because I'm being prompted and I'm trusting that voice. And I, I call that voice my friend. And my friend, uh, and everyone has one, if they are listening and so forth, 
And I've uh, come to the conclusion it will never, and I will use that word, ever put you in harm's way. It will challenge you from time to time, but it will never put you in harm's way if you listen to and follow the promptings. As we continue talking with Eliana Gilad here on uh, Tell Me Your Story, I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I'm hoping that you are just staying right where you are as we continue talking about the work that Eliana Gilad is talking to us about, especially in terms of the work that she does. Now, I shared with you earlier, uh, Eliana, that we deal on this program, we've had Jonathan Goldman on this program talking about uh, humming and whistling and toning and music and notes. And I've talked with people on this program uh, about the Mozart effect. I loved the research that that I did on that because when I first researched it, it kind of gave me a, a, an indication as to what that was all about. And then a few days later, I found another article that poo-pooed the whole thing. Of course, my first question is, well, why Mozart? Why not Bach, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Why? Oh, I was... love this question. I haven't been asked this in a bazillion in one year. Oh, well. you, want it, you want my response? Go for it. I, I, I didn't even think that you were aware of it, but yeah, please. What's your observation? Well, Don, Don Campbell was also a dear colleague. Also, Jonathan Goldman. Uh, God bless Jonathan. And uh, uh Don Campbell and Barbara Marks Hubbard, I was in the midst of bringing them to Israel for, for, for birth at the turn of the millennium. And then remember why 2K happened? Oh, like, killed, killed the whole thing. <laughs> uh, okay. So, <laughs> so but, but that didn't stop us from, you know, from connecting and working together, uh, working together later. Uh, but the Mozart, let's go to the Mozart effect. Yeah. All right. So, so my, uh, so having lived in the Middle East for 25 years, I'm so blessed to have done that because it enabled me and, and being a member of the Levite tribe, it's like in my DNA, I have the ancient way in me. It's not in my head. Makes absolutely no sense, but I know it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I dare follow the, you know, like you're telling about your, I, I dare follow that voice. And my musical training is in the Eastern approach to music. Very, very different than the Western approach. For example, in, in the Western approach to music, think about a keyboard on a piano. White keys, black keys. Don't need to understand music. That between the white, two white keys, there's you know there's the interval, the half interval, and in either uh, the black key. Mm -hmm. so, so the interval between do and re, between C and D, there are two half steps divided in half. In the Eastern world, that same interval is divided between nine and thirteen, not just a half a key. Hmm. which means an ear and our ear is the first upper appendage that is fully developed at 13 at 16 weeks in utero. That means an ear that is born in the Eastern world. When I say the Eastern world, I mean from North Africa to the Middle East, to the Mediterranean, to Central Asia, to the Mediterranean, to India, all those areas. That ear, an ear is acculturated. We learn by listening. It's not cognitive. So an ear that's born in the Eastern world is more sensitive than a Western ear. Mm. Animals, this, I mean, I really cover this in my second TED Talk. If anybody's really interested in this, you go watch. Uh, it's called Trust Your Silent Voice. A, an uh, we hear a human being hears at the level of coma, which is, and if you take that interval between do and re, mm -hmm. in the West, we're listening at, uh, you know, a half. But I said that same interval is divided into nine. And up in Azerbaijan, they, they divide it into 13. Nine is a coma. 
K-O-M-A. And, and each coma is divided into cents. We used to have this little knob on the old computers, you know, when we had those machines and there'd be knobs, there was a knob for cents, C-E-N-T. Mm -hmm. Animals here at the level of scent, which is why um, in, the, in the tsunami, the, there was an island where the animals, they went to the top and the people knew the vibration. They followed the animals and they were the only people who survived because voice is vibratory. This is, and, and this connects to Mozart, but why? What's all this connection? It's that in the Eastern approach to music, there are still, it was handed down by generation to generation. It was not learned cognitively. And we in the West, we have all of these follow the nine steps to <laughs> do the, this, this, you know, this way and you'll get, which from the get go, and I may be flying in the face of my colleagues too, uh, you know, with all due respect, there's no right or wrong. But the approach that we have in the Western world is you do something to get a result. And from the get go, you're from a place of disconnected from the source mm -hmm. of your power, which is behind the sound. And I believe that Mozart and, you know, Mozart uh, and, you know, all of the, like, that was a golden era of when we in humanity, we were going from, we had in ancient times, much more sophistication in the power of sound than we do today. And that that era was when we were making the switch between, you know, like in the, in the golden era that, you know, 1600s there, we were moving from um, intuitive, you know, and, and from a musical standpoint, mm -hmm. those, those composers had the mix of both because they had, you know, humanity was still, it still had the, the visceral side of life. And yet the church was coming in and, and our do re mi fa sol la si, that actually is from the church. That was a, that was a prayer. Mm. And that's our basic, um, you know, our, 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 I'm thinking in Hebrew now, you know, that's our basic model for music, but in an Eastern approach to music, that's one little thing. There are hundreds and hundreds. It's so much more sophisticated that our mind goes, uh, like if your ear, if you ever hear like uh, something from the Eastern world, let's say an Arabic tune or Turkish. You know, oh, I used to like grate my ears. I, I would just get, I want to throw up. I couldn't listen to it because my ear didn't know how to listen to it. I grew up in, you know, I was born and raised in the United States until, until I left. My ear knew, you know, intervals. And yeah. the fantastic thing is, I, I started looking at that going, why do I want to throw up? That's really interesting. And I practiced these tools and kept letting go of, you know, what came up, what came up, what came up, what came up. And I found that my balance improved, my hearing improved, my, uh, my nerves improved. And so the closing circle of this Mozart thing is, uh, yeah, uh, with the, it's the consciousness part. It's not Mozart effect. Go listen to Mozart music. That's an American marketing shtick. I don't have any problem with that either, but it's, you know, it's like, again, it's that disconnect from who you are, but uh, they base that on Tomatis, a French doctor uh, who was very much plugged in to the essence of the sound and that's where it comes from and it goes back to your the the source is inside not outside stop looking outside yourself for answers in some system exactly 
Eliana Gillad is my guest here on the program. We're talking about the work that she's doing. Emerge Triumphant is the latest work, and she's got a lot of cool stuff, even some free things up on her website. Uh, uh, VoicesofEden.com, if I'm correct on that website, VoicesofEden.com. And uh, you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And I always enjoy our conversations with guests talking about sound and music because it evokes so many new and uh, different ideas and concepts that maybe I hadn't even thought of before. I'm going to throw one of them out to you right now, uh, Eliana Gilad, who is the author of Emerge Triumphant <clears throat> and also the website VoicesOfEden.com. Uh, you were talking just a few moments ago about uh, the American standard of the, the intervals and so forth. But one of the things that I learned about, and I don't, I haven't studied this in depth or anything. I just have a cursory knowledge of the, uh, and th this has always fascinated me, kind of like w your reaction to a, a sort of a Middle Eastern music. Uh, but I, I didn't have that reaction, but I was just curious about the ragas. And I got to thinking about them, and I actually had a few uh, folks from India who are very familiar with it, including, uh, including uh, 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 Jonathan Goldman. And they don't have those eight octaves and eight notes and half notes and so on and so on and so on, or uh, the, the, the numbers aren't relevant, but uh, sharps and flats. They've got hundreds, and it's like what you were just describing. Yeah, it, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah it's all and the same know, thing. If you want, beautiful. This is the same. Uh, this is this is actually up until current day. If you go in India and you want to become a, a classical Indian musician, mm -hmm. you go to a guru. You go to a mentor. You don't go to a school and learn this stuff. Right. I have two stories about this. So you go and. You, you know, whatever instrument you're going to, you go to the best who you can find. And that mentor will not allow, you won't ever pick up the instrument until you first learn to align with the first instrument, which is yourself. You first learn, you listen to the rhythm, you sing the rhythm, vocally not to perform and that's the other thing the value in since we're speaking about the the ragas and and there's so many stories i love it <laughs> thank you no this is fun i haven't thought of this in a long time so there's no um like in the west we have um you know, the performer. Here I am. I'm sitting here right now. I'm looking at the Hollywood sign. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I was born in Hollywood and I'm living here again, looking at that sign. All right. We like perform even in the spiritual. We achieve our enlightenment. We're just we do it the best. <laughs> ego, 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 ego. And I'm not judging it. That's, you know, that's from this place. It's not a right or a wrong. We all have. We all, you know, every human being, if we're in a body, we have an ego. Right. <laughs> all right. But how are you using that? In, well, in Voices of Eden approach, it's you're using your ego to let it go. Being the instrument, being in service to the sound. That's based on this ancient way. Like in, in India, they're like the, in classical music, the value isn't how well you perform. The, the, the musician and the audience are, they're one unit. One mm -hmm. needs the other. And the value of the musician is how the musician moves the audience. And they're like, um, the, the audience uh, also participates and their response is what offers to the musician. So this brings me to a story in that uh, you see the drums in back of me. I was going to ask you about those. Um, are any of those three that I'm looking at barons or are those something other than that? No, the boron is a, is a it, you're correct. It's a frame drum. A boron comes from these. Uh, here, let me pick up this. Sure. 
And of course, we're talking with Eliana Gilad, uh, author of uh, Emerge Triumphant. And when we get to the end of this interview, we will have emerged triumphant. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So this is a frame drum. This uh, is from Turkey. And the story is co actually connected with this particular drum. Um, uh, this is called the Bendil in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. There'll be different names because of each of these micro things. It's a different value. It's a different, brings you to a different state of mind. Mm -hmm. It's like happiness and grief. They're two different states of mind. They're both emotions, but they have, you know, totally different effects, right? right. Mm -hmm. You got a cold, you take Kleenex and you blow your nose. Uh, you have a bad stomach. I, I don't, you know, they're just different, yeah. you know, different states. Exactly. So, so um, I go to Istanbul. There, there was a music maestro who came to Israel and we performed together. And my, the drum that I had that I learned with was ca called Daira from Uzbekistan. And when I would uh, uh, perform, or actually there was a European record company who invested in, they were very interested in this music. So they invested in a project and I was still using the daira from Uzbekistan. All right, cherry wood like this thick and when we would perform, we would have little space heaters and that's how, because you have to tune the drum. Otherwise, you couldn't just play it. Oh, it's a hand drum. These are you know, like this. You can actually. Tune. Yeah. That's how I ended up. That's how I ended up going to Turkey and getting this drum because it took like 20 hours over budget. <laughs> well, because I was with other musicians and I had to, and it was in summer when we were recording and there was the uh, uh, air conditioning and then we'd have to turn off the air conditioning for the sound and then I put on the heat and then it would get too hot and then we put, <laughs> it was like just, you know, just to have the coordination mm -hmm. with, with the, with the other musicians. And so when I met Najati, he goes, come, you know, come to Turkey. You know, I could, they're professional, you know, handmade and they're, we have tunable daila. So I went to, I went to Istanbul. And when I got there, he said, I have a special, I have a special treat for you. We have another maestro who just came, who just arrived today from Egypt. And we're going to have an event this evening, you know, and I want to invite you as a special guest. I'm like, oh my God, this is like heaven. So he picks us up and we go to a home with a huge living room and they're like chairs all around. And we go in and they're not rows and we're kind of just like sitting around and you don't really know what's happening. No one's saying, okay, in 15 minutes, we're going to start. Slowly, slowly, people come in and you don't even know who the musicians are, but like kind of over there in the side, you start seeing them taking out uh, instruments. And then these women come around with local, you know, with Turkish delights and tea in there. And nobody's talking and mm -hmm. it's quiet in there. And it's like, what? I, you know, and I'm in a foreign place, so, and there's no English, it's just Turkish, you know, <laughs> and, and so I can't really even speak to anybody, I'm just, I mean, this is so interesting, this is like majorly cool, but after about a half hour or so, it's like, when is this, what, what, when is this starting, and there was never a point where it began, just at some point you realize that the music is going on and you're part of the music. And then because at some point in the middle, maybe an hour into this, an hour and a half, an hour, hour and a half into it, I'm like the rhythm is getting, 
and there was an extra drum somewhere. And I went and I picked up the drum and I started playing. And it was, you know, and the musicians are smiling at me and I'm just sitting there playing the rhythm. I wasn't performing. I was, and I wasn't sitting with them. They were like over there and I was here. All right, then there's a break, more locum. And then it's time to introduce the special maestro guest who was an American who was an expert in the Egyptian drum, in the Rik. And then he played. And it was, he played beautifully. But he mm. was American and he was performing. And the energy was, I'm an expert. And when the others played, it was such a great lesson. And he was fabulous. Mm -hmm. But there was no way I was going to pick up the drum and play with that guy because that would have been an offense to him he's mm -hmm. i'm the maestro it you know it's egoic i'm the maestro i'm performing and they were both beautiful but they were very very different and when the others ended there was no applaud either and i realized afterwards mm -hmm. oh they're sufi they're sufis nobody said we're Sufis and here's a Sufi number. And here's, you know, to, I just, I knew it by, by their example. They imbibed it. The American performed it, per, not that, performed his rhythms. He was, you know, like with prowess. Yeah. And I would say, you know, that's a beautiful example of feminine and masculine energy. They were all men. There were no women, you know, but the Sufi, that was very feminine. And the American, while he was playing Eastern, which is very feminine, it was, you know, very masculine. Is one better than the other? No. Just different. Very different. Yeah. Yet the, I'll say that the, the first, you know, the Turks, for me, I mean, that just, takes my breath away because it, you know, it moves me from the inside out. The, you know, the prowess of the performance, while it was so fun to hear, you know, it was so wonderful to hear, but do I remember it? No, no. You know, it was one person playing something and he was great. Mm -hmm. Big F deal. <laughs> do you want to, you know, do what do you, what are you investing in? What are you in service to? Mm -hmm. To look good and to, and I'm not judging the, the sure. musician either, but it, you know, in what we're dealing with today is we're having a breakdown of that looking good and performance. And we have a huge opportunity now in this gap where no one knows what the F is going on. And I think that's a really fabulous thing. It's not comfortable. It is bloody. It is messy. It is contractions. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if we will only step aside, like the midwife said, you know, and allow for the nature to take over. And there are these ancient tools. That's what, you know, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. I get to be of service when all hell is breaking loose. I've lived through three wars. It's like, I'm, God, thank God I went through all of that. Yeah. Because now it's like there's a movement forward. And like you say, you know, and the baby will be born. And my God, you know, I want to invite us to imagine instead of reacting to all the mayhem that you hear. The reason why I'm speaking to all you dear listeners right now is that I'm a former CBS broadcaster. If you're in the United States and you watched the Olympics in 1992, it was my voice that you were hearing broadcast. And I had already thrown away my television set. <laughs> during, and during that time, I prayed to use my voice for a higher purpose. Mm. And that's what I'm doing here today, using media for a constructive purpose. Because um, we don't have any control over what gets what gets triggered we have absolute control over how we respond mm -hmm. the images in media today are so you know like with the news before the internet before social media 
there were, you know, we'd get a newspaper or you'd watch the evening, you know, the morning news or the evening news twice a day. Mm -hmm. Now you scroll and you're getting your news all day long and the ante is so up and commercial news, it's fed by fear mongering. It's fed by selling advertisement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not judging that either. That's just how it is. And you have a choice of what you, of what you, of what you choose to do. Exactly. And imagine what happens, why this whole approach is called Voices of Eden. It may sound woo-woo, it's not woo-woo. Uh, I mean, believe what you want, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a living experiment of creating Eden on Earth, one authentic voice at a time. If I can listen to my voice and, and be in service to this thing, which made absolutely no sense and act upon something which makes no sense because I am out of my mind. It's another, <laughs> paradigm. it's another paradigm. But if I could go to a hospital and I'm not a doctor and approach and suggest a healing music project and it results in a three-year fully funded research that today is the benchmark in the field of healing sound, and I'm the instigator of it, take your nudges seriously. It, 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 it'll bring you to, to good. I'm not the only one. Richard, you know, like I couldn't have explained it better. He, he also does. We each, if you think about it, you've got a story, which brings me to a last thing. See this bracelet? Mm -hmm. Your voice makes a difference movement. I'm starting a movement. And if you go to yourvoicemakesadifference.com and you write your story of when you had a nudge and your other voices go, no, you can't believe, you know, all the exhaustion that we've been talking about, but you actually, but you actually listened to your true voice of reason, the one that didn't make sense that you acted upon. Mm -hmm. And what good has, what good has, did it bring you or is it bringing you mm -hmm. write it in there? I will send you to the first hundred people. All right. Cause I have a hundred <laughs> okay. in these. All right. And it is working like a charm for me. Here's how you use it. What I'm doing is I'm like, anytime my dissing voice comes up and I, I you know, like I'm choosing to support my own voice of reason, just as what, what we're talking about, the exhaustion that, you know, you make plans and they don't go awry, do they? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I'm, you know, like the next arrivement du jour, you know, comes up or of the moment. I just take this off. I go, you know, I'm, I'm remember to be kind to myself. And it's like, no, I'm going to trust. And I put it on the other side and I'm reprogramming my brain because my voice at that point, it's like your silent voice is so much more powerful than what's coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it is calming me so much. So if you, you know, if so, I'm starting this movement so that there's just so much bullhooey that, and, and that's why I'm doing this media tour now to be a voice of reason, not to prove anything, but to show up. Each one of our voices makes a difference. And exactly. when you don't express your voice, and we, there are no two that are alike. So when there's, here's full circle. When, when you focus on the dissension, how are, nothing's the same. No two people are alike. There are no two voices alike. The only thing we have in common is where we come from and where we go back to. That's and right. I wonder what would happen as we each one in their own rhythm in their own time connect to that yeah that's you know that to me is eden that's the world i want to live in that's how i'm choosing to show up i'm one person amongst billions and so are you but it's not about numbers it's about attitude and <laughs> where you're coming from are you coming from here or listening and connecting to your power right
VoicesofEden.com is the website. Eliana Gilad is my guest, and you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, Eliana, I want to thank you so much. I wish we had more time. Uh, we're uh, fast approaching the end of our, our program today, but I would love to have you back to continue this conversation and talk about some of the other areas, the things that you offer on your website, the courses, the classes, the videos that you've got up there, including, folks, I'm sure if you have uh, the TED Talk channel, I'm sure you can find Eliana's uh, uh, TED Talks. Yeah, you can actually find the first one, which is your voice, let, uh, make it heard, is actually on the voicesofeden.com uh, webpage. Uh, on the on the home page you'll find on the home page well we we certainly hope folks that you'll go there and again i thank you so much for giving us uh so much time here on the program i do have three final questions that i ask all of my guests you may have addressed them uh to some degree during the program but i like to ask them directly but before i do i want to let you the listener and the viewer know that i thank you so much for listening to and watching tell me your story new paradigms for a new world as we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true sunday Days at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., and our special edition of Tell Me Your Story, 9 a.m. Wednesdays. We stream live at those times at richarddugan.com. Uh, the podcasts are available on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many others across the internet. And we are video casting on YouTube where you can watch these interviews. As I said before, we will be linked to uh, Eliana's uh, website voicesofeden.com so we hope that you will go there and find out more about uh, what she is doing we also hope you'll subscribe to the podcast and video cast not i i'm not interested in raising my numbers of subscribers that is irrelevant to me i want you to be notified when you're a subscriber you are notified of new content new interviews that are available for you to listen to and watch so that's the impetus uh you subscribe anonymously that's fine uh, i i'm appreciative of those who do subscribe but i'm also appreciative of those who just go and listen because the listenership on both platforms is way up we also encourage you to spend time during the decade of perfect vision going within listening to that still small voice we ask you to spend time in that quiet peaceful calm space and just listen and listen for that inspiration, that guidance, that education, uh, insight, uh, whatever you are looking for, you'll find it there. That's why we call it the, perf the place of perfect vision, the 2020s, because that's where you will get perfect vision for you. And if you'd like to support the work we are doing financially, we have a PayPal account. It's there for your security as well as ours. We will uh, receive any amount graciously and gratefully. We thank you, thank you, thank you for those who have helped and those who will help. And with that, we go to our final three questions to our guest who has been with us for just about an hour here on the program, and we will have her back. Uh, so the first of those three questions, who is Elian Gilad? Who is Eliana Gilad? All right, so my name Eliana Gilad is who I am. Uh, in Hebrew, Eliana means my higher power answered me. Gilad means eternal joy. When you call my name, you're calling to yourself. Eliana Gilad is an instrument in service to the highest good of all. She is not a, a, a ego driven person being in a body going blah, 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 blah. She is in this body as an instrument to uh, serve other people to dare to stop and listen to themselves inside and trust what they're hearing, have the courage to act upon it and act upon it because that gives you the confidence to be who you already are and it brings good what's wrong with that. That's who Eliana Gilad is. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you are doing now? Well, uh, emerge triumphant, thrive through uncertainty, which you'll find at voicesofeden.com forward slash book. The fact that that book reached number one international bestseller in six different categories within 24 hours of its launch proves that there is a window of opening and a window of support for you to 
get out of your exhaustion and your depletion and your annoyance and uh, that is makes so much sense to what's going on today. My intention is, and the goal is for as many people to avail themselves. The, the book itself is not a cognitive book. It's a book in real teeny, beeny, 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 beeny pieces. And there's a free course that goes along with it to help you connect within to your, to your power and then have the clarity to know what's next for you. That's the goal. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Same thing. Be of service to highest good. I, I, am, I am in my purpose. <laughs> being who I am, being real, how I'm showing up now is no different than I show up in my personal life. And it is time that we free ourselves and allow ourselves to be who we already are. How difficult is that? You're wonderful, you're beautiful. Even with, you know, no matter what bombs are dropping in your life inside or out, it's like the, the sun still comes up and the sun still sets and the moon still comes out and the flowers are still there and the birds are still chirping and you have a choice of what you focus on and, um, and I invite you to, to uh, you know, all of us to choose our good. Mm. Well, Eliana Gillad, thank you so much for joining us on the program once again. I look forward to having you back to continue our conversation. Thank you so much. And I, <laughs> and I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, as we are giving you new choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to Lal and Jeanette, I'm listening.